people want to, you know, sniff rat poison, that's their business. So the state, you know, as this bad religious entity, this authoritarian dictatorship, totalitarian entity, uh, you know, wants to dictate to us what we can and can't put in our body, yet they, they approve all these chemicals are put in our food, you know, not to mention the GMOs and, and all of it. I mean, you know, artificial fertilizers, the whole gamut is not good. You know, we the people have a right to clean fruit, but these food, but these, you know, these things we can't have according to the state or we don't deserve. Uh, but, you know, it's fine that, you know, the state comes in and says, we've got to save the earth. You know, we've got to, we've got to cut back our carbon footprint. When really, you know, the earth we find out is creating so much of the carbon, and um, the whole thing's a setup. They're putting this fluoride in our water, and if you see the, the bags of fluoride they dump in the municipal water supply in so many areas, it's got a skull and crossbones on it. I mean, if fluoride is so beneficial, educate people, and then they can choose for themselves if they want to go ingest fluoride, drink, you know, sodium fluoride, okay? But, you know, they know that 99.99% of people aren't going to do it. They're going to say, that's stupid. I need such a small amount because it is a necessary element, you know, that, uh, you know, human element that we have a little fluoride, but, <clears throat> you know, we don't want to be dosed without our knowledge or consent. We want to be educated and be able to choose what we put and don't put in our body. But the state wants to say, oh, you can't put this or that in your body. Well, educate people about the dangers of heroin. That's great. Educate people about the, the dangers of methamphetamine. That's great. You know, show the before and after pictures. I think this is very effective because people see in what short order they can destroy their physical health by doing uh, methamphetamine or heroin. I mean, how many people have died from heroin overdoses? So it's not a safe drug, and I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend rat poison either. I wouldn't recommend cocaine. I wouldn't recommend anything that's going to harm you. How about alcohol? It's a very strong drug that dr destroys a lot of lives. And I'm opposed to drunk driving. I'm opposed to anybody driving in any way that they're compromised. Okay, because I believe in protecting the safety of other people. I believe highway safety should be a focus that, you know, we collectively can say, okay, this is an issue we can agree on. It'd be better to have less pedestrian injuries, less pedestrian deaths, less bicyclist injuries, less bicyclist deaths, be less to see less highway deaths that are preventable by spending the money. I mean, we want to spend money on the vaccines. There are, the government's all willing to do this and that with that and the next thing. But when it comes down to the really important issues, you know, like, you know, highway debt, how horrible is that? Of all the things I worry about with my daughters, it's probably driving, that they're going to hit some bicyclist. Or, think how easy it is, hit a pedestrian or, you know, get killed in a car accident because of some drunk driver. Maybe, God, God forbid, they were foolish enough to drive in any way compromised or distracted because distractions, as we all know, are very dangerous as well. So I'm a big proponent of highway safety and safety overall. But, you know, and so if the laws are based on moral things, that's fine. So if the state is a good religion and we're doing good things and we're doing it in a way that's educating people and dissuading them from wanting to do foolish things like harm their health, you know, by, by using drugs and alcohol, uh, you know, that's great. I'm all for the educational aspect, enlighten people, why they don't want to do these things, why it's so bad to drive drunk, okay? That, I'm all for that, you know, and to spend whatever money we need to because you got this workforce that's just, you know, been laid idle and, you know, hey, we don't need you anymore. But, you know, we know there's all these projects we could be working on to make the highway safer for everybody and our children, but yet we're not spending there. They're, that state's picking and choosing. So we can't even earmark when you pay your taxes, you know, when you pay sales tax, whatever tax. Remember, the poor are paying those sales taxes too. Uh, you know, earmarking where it gets to go. You can't do that. With a church, you can at least know that, hey, it's going, well, I know it's supporting this preacher or this cause and that cause, you know, and it's of your own free will. It's voluntary. But the state doesn't give you that option to make it voluntary. It's mandated. It's, it's you know, you're coerced to pay the state. So it's a bad religion in that sense, and it's an oppressive and tyrannical religion in that sense. And we've all got to see it like this. You know, we've all got to just really ask ourselves some fundamental questions like, can humanity get along with each other? Can we really realize a state on earth 
where we have a true civilization. And if you dissect that word civilization, a key component of that word is civil. Are we behaving in a civil manner? Are we really living like a family, the one family, the family of man? Do you care about the interests of the least of men, like Jesus said, as much as you care about your very own interests or the interests of your children or your brothers, your blood brothers and sisters and you know your, your parents and your whatever, your direct relatives, okay? Because that's the mindset we have to embrace. We have to say, I need to behave toward my fellow human being the way God wants me to behave because this is the only way I'm going to find happiness. And short of achieving that goal and it being successful in that regard, then I am never going to find true happiness. I'm never be, going to be content just having made, you know, millions upon millions of dollars or billions upon billions of dollars is never going to make me happy. As long as my fellow brother or sister, my fellow human being is suffering needlessly, I can't find happiness. This is an immutable, it's an example of an immutable law of the universe. It's like karmic laws. It's like the law of as you sow, so you too sh shall reap. Okay, that's what makes sense. That's what's logical. That's what's scientifically provable. So that's what an immutable law is. None of us can get away from it. We are inextricably entangled in the affairs of our fellow human beings. It's on an osmotic level. It's in our conscience. And if we try to divorce ourselves from the plight of our brothers and sisters who are having a harder time contending with this system, okay, then we are not godly children. We are not walking with God's sanctity and His, His okay, His approval. Okay, It is outside of those bounds. We're walking in a worldly manner. We might be worldly-wise successful. You know, we might have what it takes to, you know, to contend with this world. We might have the shrewdness to say, you got to shut all that out, say, I'm the landlord, I'm raising your rent, I'm the boss, and I'm a good guy, and, you know, I take care of my kids, and, you know, so I've got to raise your rent, so I can't worry about how that's going to affect you. I can't worry that, you know, how, how, what kind of fear that imposes on you, because this is, after all, a dog-eat-dog -dog rat race, and, you know, they just get with the program, become like me, become a landlord, and then, you know, you'll see what it's like you know, when you've got to raise their rent, but, you know, you do it because, hey, it's good for you and your family, it's good for your side of the, the, uh, the ledger, you know, the uh, mathematical equation of hoarding money, you know, and, and uh, you understand how deeply and profoundly humanity is divided and the obstacles we're facing and how once this system is established like it is like this, how now it's not in the interest to solve the problems, this is the biggest thing we have to get, folks. We have to ask ourselves, who has taught us, you know, that we can't have our cake and eat it too? You know, this is a saying I haven't even looked up because I just see it as bull. Who, who, what, what is cake? You know, what do they mean by eating it? And I say, wait a minute, does that, is that from the Bible or what? Is that something God said? No. No, God's saying you can have your cake and you can eat it too. And this is his will for us as his children. He wants us to be happy and content and free and safe and secure and prosperous. He wants that for us, okay? If I know anything, I know that. I know he doesn't just want that for me and my kids. He wants that for you and your kids. He wants that for everybody. And we have to embrace that idea when it comes to figuring out how the way out of this mess. Because I don't want to take from anybody. I don't want to threaten anybody's job. You know, and... Uh, uh, think of the all the people employed in the problem industrial complex. I mean, we're talking about, now I'm talking about the debt, all the people employed in the debt industrial complex are part of this giant monopoly. Uh, all the people employed in the, the criminal industrial complex because a lot of the laws are just made up in phony baloney and um, not based on morality or ethics. And, uh, and the fact that uh, so many crimes are committed because of financial desperation which, of course, we know the financial desperation was invented. So, you know, we always want to blame the people that, that snap, you know, the weakest links in the chain. We want to blame the effects of what the causers have imposed on it, because it's easier. We say, well, we don't know how to get these people 
to loosen their purse strings at the very top. We know that the wealth exists and you know they people have just robbed our wealth and that they want the poverty, the problems that go along with the poverty, the chaos. That's how they control us. That's how it's all relative. That's how they are the mega wealthy. Because if everybody was rich then you know, the, all their prosperity, their worldly prosperity, they find out would, would be comme ça, comme ça. Who really cares that you're rich? I'm rich too, buddy. Get over it. Go have fun. Go build a house. Go work at a car factory. Go do something useful. Okay? You know, I mean, seriously, folks, we could have such a reduced work week if people were all just doing productive jobs instead of all these non productive invented jobs. And even doing all those non productive invented jobs because of the problems they've invented. Uh, you know, you, you'd see, you've got, we still got unemployment. So, I, the idea that we shouldn't reduce our work week down to where it's logical and realistic is absurd to me. It's preposterous, yet everybody goes along. I don't hear hardly anybody even talking about these issues. But we need like a like a five, ten hour work week probably at the most. That way everybody can feel relevant and useful out there. Like they're not just takers. People don't just want to take. They don't just want to be entitled. They want to be givers. Everybody wants to be a giver, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm speaking logic. That's all. That's all I'm doing. I'm just pointing to, you know, I can point to the science of the matter, the mathematics of the matter. <laughs> Another whole segment of jobs that would become unnecessary, we've got the, uh, the criminal industrial complex, you know, that's based on mostly poverty and, and phony you know, made up laws, and then we've got the uh, debt industrial complex, and then you've got the, the war industrial complex. So any dubious warfare that we're all a little reticent about, uh, that wouldn't exist anymore because, you know, it's going to be very hard to get a guy to go off to war that he's kind of, you know, I'm not too sure about this one. It kind of, I don't know about that. Are these really the bad guys and what did they do? Like Vietnam, in retrospect, so many people say, what the hell were we even doing there? What the hell, you know, we acted, you know, we fight with such vigor and passion against what? How are these people our enemy? What did they do to us? We're in their land, trying to impose our way on them, and they don't want that. Go away, you know? I mean, but, you know, I don't, I don't condone violence on either side, so I don't condone our troops getting murdered. I don't, I don't condone, uh, you know, innocent civilians being murdered. I, I don't condone anybody being murdered. I'm a nonviolent guy. I say everything I want to say. I get everything off my chest. And the way I do that is by being a nonviolent guy. Because I know in my heart of hearts, in the marrow of my soul, that I want the best for everybody. Okay? And who put that in my heart? I always have to acknowledge God and glorify God and praise God for that, like you should too. When He puts those good things in your heart, say, you know what? I want the best for not some people. Not just for myself. I don't want to be selfish. I want the best for everybody because I know that's how I'm going to enjoy my life is once everybody else's life is is okay. You know, like I like to say, I'll be happy when the last guy on earth finds happiness. I want to be at the back of the line, so to speak. And that might seem impractical to a lot of people. And you know, but listen, the point is clear: is that I understand the interconnectivity of your happiness and my happiness. I want you to be happy, but I don't want you to be you know, faked into believing you can find happiness just through uh, worldly, su worldly success, which is, as most people would define it, is financial success. I want you to understand that, you know, what wealth really is, is the kind of things that Jesus taught. You know, the, the treasures, store our treasures in heaven, and heaven is within our heart and mind. It's in our imagination. These are the places where this is. It's that place where you want to go to, where you want your kids to be where, you know, everything is perfect and fine and nobody's afraid of anything. You know, nobody's being oppressed. Nobody's being, being treated shamefully or